My name is Sheila Morrow and I am the Vice President of Sales and Marketing and I coordinate professional development for Mindwing Concepts and I'm also Mary Ellen's daughter. We work together. For those of you that we know, hello, and those of you that are new to us, welcome. I wanted to say a couple of other things about the webinar. We are not going to be reviewing Story Grammar Marker and the developmental sequence per se because Mary Ellen has a lot of content with books that, that she needs to get through with you. And so if you're someone who's new to Story Grammar Marker, the best thing for you to do is to go to our webinar section another time on our website, mindwingconcepts.com, and the best thing for you to do is to watch the um, story grammar marker, uh, two key things that set it apart. That's the title of it, and that would be great. All right. So, uh, Sheila said this was my show, and I'm glad to have it. Um, so, I wanted to um, just mention that there are many books that, for instance, the ones I'm showing, that I really do feature when I do a workshop. So I'm not going to be featuring them tonight, but you all know about them. Um, about why I choose quality children's literature. Um, <clears throat> because I like to use it as a read aloud and as a think aloud to have children join with me as we analyze the text and we look at language features and also at the great illustrations that accompany the text and a lot of times elaborate on the text. Those of you who have been to other workshops have seen this building blocks of language diagram, which focuses on the um, thought that oral language is the foundation of literacy. And we're talking about the strands of oral language which, which form the braid and the story grammar marker and Brady. So there's discourse, which we're talking about today, narrative discourse and the structure of it. But within that discourse structure, you have sentences, simple, compound, and complex. You have semantics, which vary among um, all kinds of vocabulary. You also have the phonology or the words themselves, pragmatics, which would be the social uses of everything, and at the very bottom, forming the foundation of everything, is the child who comes to us with his, his or her experiences from whatever environment they are. So the top and the peak is college and career readiness. What is the story grammar marker? Just very quickly. It is the basic unit of a plot. And of course, a plot is several um, episodes. So the character, these are all the icons that were chosen over 26 years ago to represent the parts of a story that I found that children could maybe answer questions about, but couldn't pull together if they were asked to tell the story. So, as I'm going to talk about it tonight, this develops in a gradual way over time, and we can go back and forth with building it and um, building it up and breaking it down. Okay. Okay, now the critical thinking triangle a lot of you know about is the part that's missing from other graphic organizers and it's what sets the story grammar marker apart. We've talked about that a lot. The development of the critical thinking triangle builds the complexity of the narrative. So it's for character motivation. It's for inference generation. It's used for perspective taking, practice with classroom discourse using cohesive ties, and um, there are things that aren't showing up. But there's, it's, it's vital for inferencing and for understanding higher level text. 
theory of mind, critical thinking, problem solving, and social communication. Now, this is just a wonderful diagram that was created to show that there are varying complexity levels of story grammar marker. The icons themselves are dancing on top of this water, but below it are the developmental stages, which I'm going to talk about tonight, and that lists of books are located within your handout. Uh, at the very bottom and in the deepest water is thinking, feeling, planning, and conflict resolution. So tonight, we're really going to focus on this developmental seven stages. And what I'd like you to notice right now is that it gradually builds. So very, very young children, they love certain stories because they focus on characters and settings. And that's what they're focused on in their lives. Soon, they focus on actions, then, uh-oh, look what happened, kickoffs and reactions, feelings appear. The complete episode is at stage five. And then when new kickoffs start to happen relative to um, the complexity of the plot, that's a complex episode. And then stage seven is interactive, where some kind of an event happened, an initiating event or a kickoff, and characters felt a certain way and developed their own plan. So I'm going to be pointing out books that I like to use within these stages. And from the inception of the Story Grammar Marker until now, we have all of these products that we've developed over time, focusing on changes in education, changes in special education, and particularly in the speech and language area. So stage one is um, the descriptive sequence. And I mentioned that it's characters and settings. And one of my favorites is Five Senses by Aliki. And it's a staple of mine because often in schools, the five senses will be used to describe the character um, and what the character sees and hears, touches in the setting. Um, all five senses are each on one of the tips of the star, which indicates the setting. The next book is Every Autumn Comes the Bear. And this is about a particular time of the year, a particular time being autumn. The illustrations are full page watercolors and vibrant colors to represent the actions within a setting, which don't have to be in a sequence, they're just there, and the bear is doing them. The third one is Mirror, which shows facing pages comparing and contrasting two different cultures, one um, uh, from Morocco and one from Australia and how these two cultures are more the same than they are different as you go through the book. It's wordless, and the illustrations are collage. And I noticed that our um, illustrators are being focused on more as we um, progress in really the study of literacy. The next book is Zoom. It's another wordless book, and it's been a motivation for older students who don't really want to focus on the setting, but don't get the details. And it zooms in and expands on the setting. So um, it's from a farm to a ship to a city to an island. And there's a sequel called Resume, which has different other different settings. Um, so multiple cultures are represented in this book as well. This one is about Emily Dickinson the study of characterization through the eyes of a child who observes the actions of this person known as the Bell of Amherst and was the uh, namesake of my dorm at the University of Massachusetts. So I wanted to put this in, but I like it because it doesn't say what she did or what she didn't do in her life that made her famous. It was just by her actions that this little girl got to know Emily Dickinson as a person. 
Good Night Moon, when I think of characters and settings and young children, this is what I think of. It shows the passing of time, um, and it is uh, purely characters in a setting. There are three bears, there's a bunny, there's a mouse, there's the little old lady who's sitting there, but time passes visually through the setting, through the window. The Little Island is a Caldecott Award book, and it's about characters within a setting. It shows four season changes, so it's not just one change, it's not just one season, and it's not just the time of a day, it's season changes and storms showing different characters within settings such as fireflies, bats, and owls at night. So it's the description of an entity, in other words, an island. Another one about an island is The Big Wave by Pearl Buck, and I want you to notice that there are free lessons on our Mindwing Concepts website. Um, on this big wave. It's a chapter book um, and it's a compare contrast also because within narratives there are elements of expository text that the author has chosen to present. So part of the author's purpose here was to compare and contrast an island in Japan, the farming area, and the fishing area. The theme is bravery, and a tidal wave is the concept that is presented. Winter walk is a very simple walk through a specific season. What the little character touches, tastes, and feels, so it incorporates the senses. Amelia Tesora, I just love this book. Um, it's a short description with inspirational quotes by each of these 26 women who changed the world. Amelia Earhart to Zora Neale Hurston, an African-American writer. Jane Goodall is represented. It's ethnically diverse, very brief, and focuses on life events. And it in, has inspired young people to dig deeper, which is what we want them to do. Big Al and Shrimpy. Uh, as you know, Big Al was my first book I ever used with Story Grammar Marker. This is a sequel to Big Al. It's by the same author. It's a parallel structure, meaning in the wide blue sea, there was a, and it's very, very similarly set up, a very clever fish named Shrimpy. You couldn't find a smarter fish. But in it, Big Al remembers things. So Big Al and Shrimpy become friends, and Big Al, um, Shrimpy saves Big Al. The illustrations are by Yoshi, which are dynamic. Country Kid, City Kid is a compare-contrast story about two children, and it also has facing pages that can open, and you can see each one. It's contrasting and comparing two children who live in a different setting. There are many similarities communicated by the illustrations. When the girl is wearing a red shirt, the boy is wearing a red hat. So there's color connections, and um, they end up meeting at a place called Camp Eagle, where they become friends. And that's probably foreshadowed by the fact that they wear similar colors throughout. The next book was recommended to me, and a copy was given to me in New York City, where I often go to provide professional development by a speech pathologist there, whose granddaughter illustrated the book. And it's another compare-contrast, um, multicultural journey of two dogs, J.D. and Sparky. But the beauty of it is that the child has illustrated it. Where Spot explores a setting. Spot explores his own setting, and it's a flat book. So normal settings where you wouldn't typically find a dog, you find Spot. Um, so it's just a fun book for children. The Pop-Up Mice of Mr. Bryce is three-dimensional. It has flaps, it has pop-ups, it has add-ons, it has pull tabs. Um, it's very, very interactive. 
it describes 26 mice and talks about the verbs of what they like and don't like to do. So verbs are an emphasis. Likes and dislikes, which describe characters, are an emphasis. The salamander room focuses on changes in a setting to accommodate a salamander. Now, mom is uh, the person who asks the questions. Where will he sleep if you take the salamander in our house? When he wakes up, where will he play? Will he get hungry? What will he eat? So the questions posed make the little boy think, and he imagines how this salamander room might look. And as he imagines, the pictures, the illustrations get bigger. So it's really a wonderful book to show imagination. And it's also wonderful to show the expository text structure evident in how to take care of a salamander, which is something the author wanted to communicate. Sisters is a staple of mine. It's um, two sisters who are alike in many ways and different in many ways. So it's a description through listing the likes and dislikes of two sisters. It's very, very to the point. Memoirs of a Goldfish is a delightful book. The goldfish is the only one in the bowl. And over time, he notices changes in his environment, from a solo goldfish to a crowded, tank, a crowded uh, bowl. So a memoir is an observation of the events in life. It's also a reflection on a personal narrative, which um, have become very, very important. In fact, I'm speaking at ASHA about personal narratives this year, and Carol Westby has written extensively on them and how important they are to our students um, for their social development. Um, so there are actually, there are feelings shown here too, because in the eyes of the goldfish, it kind of shows some feelings, but I primarily use it for changes in a setting. The next three books are very thin paperbacks, um, and I'm I was I'm featuring them in a, a book that I'm writing about um, text complexity. But there are three of them living in rural communities, suburban communities, and urban communities, and the three books are parallel structures again as far as the language goes. Each one has the same wording different characters and settings within those communities are mentioned. So it's a great introduction to community types, which are a foundation of settings. I know a lady, I've used this many years, observation of a lady and the actions that she does through the eyes of a child and it shows the lady as kind because she gives cookies, loving, and nature loving. In other words, the woman is a role model, so it's a great one to use for intergenerational story perspective. Um, it also shows the change of the season, which indicates the aging person. So that's my favorite descriptive sequence list of books, in addition to the ones that are in our manuals that are analyzed in greater detail than I'm going into tonight, I'm hitting the high points of why I like these books, but there are many others within our manuals in the appendices. Um, for the action sequence now, I wanted to mention that it's the character and the setting, and more complex now, are the actions that are going on in some kind of a sequence. These are important because they're important when you're analyzing a book for its complexity, which a lexile alone can't do, or when you're analyzing a child's retelling or a child's writing. So this is an action sequence. The first book I like is Window. I've used it a long time. It's actions within a changing setting looked at through a window. Visual details in the description. 
So details that are very important in grade one and two are focused on in this, in this book through a window frame. The collage type of illustration is featured. Um, the message is that environment changes through the actions of people. Home is a sequel that uh, Jenny Baker wrote with the same type of thing, but reclaiming a neighborhood. So one farm, I love it. It's very simple. It's about six pages of the actions going on on a farm. It's a big picture. There's a barn. There's a nest. There's an egg. There's a crack in the egg, and there's a chick. So what is that but the hatching of a chicken, of an egg on a farm? It goes from the big structure to the little structure. A moment in time. Um, time, moments in your life don't have to be exciting to talk about. A lot of children think they don't have anything to write about because they don't have an exciting moment in their life. Um, so one of the things is to just take a moment in time. This is moments on a Cape Cod day in Massachusetts. And it's a look at life, just general things that happen, four moments in time, four different characters. And I like to use it for um, illustrating and thinking aloud about how something doesn't have to be exciting to be a kickoff. The Very Hungry Caterpillar um, by Eric Carle. Again, Massachusetts and my area here is uh, worthy of note because his museum is in Amherst. Um, this book is an action sequence if I was to um, categorize it. The cutouts in the pages in the book make it very motivating, but what it is is it's the life cycle of a caterpillar. So Eric Carle had to have science background, and that's one of my points that we are focused on looking at narrative and expository text in school. Um, that often that people who write stories incorporate information text within them. This next one is a series of actions occurring at 26 Fairmount Avenue. Tommy DiPaolo and his um, his life story is told in multiple um, books, but this one I like to use as a read aloud for a personal narrative model. He eats chocolates with Nana in the house only to realize they were laxatives. Um, he sees Snow White in the movies and discovers it was very different from the book that he read about Snow White. So there are funny things, but they're all personal experiences and very readable as a read aloud. In the Tall Tall Grass, there's a free lesson on our site, actions of animals and insects in a setting of the Tall Tall Grass. So the setting doesn't have to be uh, Washington, D.C. The setting can be something very simple. And the actions that occur in that setting, as seen through the eyes of a caterpillar, as he plays the role of a narrator. So it's looking at various insects and sounds. There's alliteration and rhyme as literary devices. So you can bring that up to the kids and point that out. It's a wonderful series of actions within a simple setting. Henry Hikes to Fitzburg um, is a play on the life of um, Henry David Thoreau, a philosopher out of Massachusetts, again, Walden Pond in Concord, Mass. And it was given to me by a principal, Johanna McKenna, in uh, Northampton, Mass, who is a philosopher herself. But what it does is it shows the action sequence of two friends who end up in Fitchburg, Mass. One hikes and notices the landscape. And that characterization is Henry David Thoreau who uh, spent two years alone observing nature at Walden Pond. And one of his friends who, paid, who worked and then paid to take the train to Fitchburg. So um, it is a, there is a primary source, a quote from Henry David Thoreau's 
diary, which was the impetus for this story, showing kids that a primary source can lead to their reflections. Um, Round Trip by Ann Jonas, I mentioned in workshops, but I wanted to mention it here. It's wonderful because of the illustrations. The book is uh, one side up and then uh, you, uh, at, when you get to the end of reading that section, you turn the book around and you read another series of actions. So it's from the country to the city and back. It cites various scenes along the way. And when you turn it upside down, the scene on the way out, which may have been a restaurant, becomes a movie theater on the way back. And with older kids, I have used this to, um, as a motivator to come up with kickoffs. And we're going to talk about them in the next stage, but a kickoff. Um, could be something that you have had happen to you in numerous settings that are provided by Ann Jonas in this particular book. This one is a takeoff on the traditional story of the gingerbread man. Of course, in this one, the um, uh, wolf or the fox eats the gingerbread boy, but people are reassured on the last page that wherever there are gingerbread cookies made, there's a possibility for a gingerbread boy. Um, we could, and I do, contrast this with Jan Brett's um, gingerbread baby, where the gingerbread boy is rescued. A gingerbread boy is rescued by a little boy, and it shows that there could be different endings to the same action sequence. So this is a series of actions. There were really no feelings or plans or anything really um, stated by the author. The salamander room here is the steps, not only to describing the salamander room as I used before, but this one now is the steps to take care of a salamander would be the action sequence that I would focus on. So sometimes you can use books, and most of the time, use them for multiple stages. This one, going on a bear hunt, is really focusing on um, the meaning of hunt is to look for a bear. Um, it's a classic preschool book and is wonderful for sounds and words like splash and splosh and swishy and swashy gross motor skills, um, the illustrations, black and white and color. Onomatopoeia is one of the literary devices. The action sequence part is they go out to find a bear, and they go past wavy grass, they go in the mud, they go past a river, they look in a cave, and then they come back through those same places followed by the bear. So obviously they're going much faster. So it's all imagination. Um, this follow that map, first book of mapping skills, I came upon this um, and put it in the action sequence stage because it's a book of how to make maps that get you from one place to another by a series of actions. Um, it's Sally um, who kind of gets going, but there's a little dog and a little cat on each of the pages, which makes it fun to find them. It's easy to follow, but it's following directions. And that's one of the first things that we look at when we look at a series of actions. This book is Five Little Pumpkins, very simple series of actions. It's for autumn. It features rhyme. And the whole hum day is where the um, pumpkins are all seated on a gate, and then each one of them, in order, does something. It, it is a finger rhyme, and it's um, just a very simple series of actions done by a series of pumpkins. Owl Moon is by Massachusetts author Jane Yolen, and um, it's about a um, a little girl and her father who go out on a winter evening owling, which some people may not know what that is, but it's to find an owl or to listen to an owl. And it's the process of going owling, what they do first, what they do next, where they go, 
it uses all the senses and of course the weather is very cold um, and uh, it's a focus on personal experiences and knowledge that is gained by personal experiences so we have that as a focus of our work with children to develop their prior knowledge through academics, but their background knowledge through experiences. And this would be an experience in a child's perspective. They receive the Caldecott Medal. Now I'm on the reactive sequence, which is the third stage of narrative, and each one builds in complexity. So this one would be characters and settings, the actions, and now a kickoff, which means that the actions have turned into reactions to the kickoff. I do want to mention the kickoff. It is a shoe indicating that it kicks off the plot. Um, it doesn't have to be a problem, but you can certainly call it a problem if it is. It could be something wonderful that happened and resulted in a surprise or whatever. Uh, the first book is Why Mosquitoes Buzz in People's Ears. It's a poor Khoi story. Um, why something happened, something in nature happened. It is a West African folktale. It received the Caldecott Medal. It's about a disaster in the jungle brought about by a falsehood that a mosquito told an iguana. And the iguana stuck sticks in the in his or her ears, which created panic, cumulative panic through the jungle. Um, so the reason why mosquitoes buzz in people's ears is because mosquitoes are still asking, "Are you mad that I caused that problem?" So it is a kickoff and reaction. So the kickoff was the mosquitoes' falsehood. The reaction was the iguana and then everybody else, the monkey who inadvertently killed an owlet, and it just got um, dicey after that. The next one is an annoying ABC that some of you uh, may not know about. Um, it's situated in a preschool classroom. There is a teacher who is dressed as if she's uh, she has combat boots on, actually. It's a culturally diverse group of children who have wonderful names, which um, are all alliteration. So there's Adelaide, and she annoyed somebody. Stella stumbled. Clyde cried. And there's a turnaround in it. So. Anyway, all the way through the first 26 kids, there are verbs that create problems in the preschool classroom. But then Adelaide apologizes, and then it all turns around as each child does something to make it better through another verb. So what is a feature here? Verbs are a feature. There is a kickoff done by each child who does something that affects somebody else, then that child does something that affects somebody else. There are really no feelings mentioned in the text at all. But it certainly comes up to asking how the um, characters are feeling. This is one I use a lot in workshops, and it um, coincides with um, how does a character respond to challenges which is one of the common core standards. Uh, it's a series of kickoffs and reactions. We often find that in books, that there may be a kickoff and a reaction, and then instead of the author carrying the um, idea through to an episode, they just bring up another, ki another kickoff and another reaction. And uh, this book is especially well done um, by Norman Bridwell, and it's a series of reactions. You can easily, though, scaffold inference to having kids infer how the characters felt about the various kickoffs. The doorbell rang, 
I love to use this by having children make their own picture of a kickoff, put it on a popsicle stick, and hold it up every time the kickoff is a focus. So the kickoff is that the um, uh, people are making cookies and they have to adapt to more children coming in to um, eat the cookies. Um, so there's a reaction each time the doorbell rings. Suddenly by Colin McNaughton, the word suddenly is a word we use to signal a kickoff. Um, the cover has an expectation of this wolf eating a pig, which would be part of um, prior knowledge or background knowledge, depending on where you come from. The wolf has a plan, and the wolf's plan is the typical plan, um, but they are foiled by chance as the um, pig, Preston, has thoughts about what he should do to change his um, where he's going. So each of the thoughts that he has is a kickoff, and he goes somewhere else and thereby avoids the wolf. It's a wonderful book set up as kickoffs and reactions. If you give a mouse a cookie is an if-then um, book. The word then isn't used. But I like to have kids put it in there. If you give a mouse a cookie is the kickoff, then he will do something. So all the way through, it's that um, text structure. This one is because a little bug went ka -choo. It begins with a ho-hum day. I like to call the setting a ho-hum day if it's what you expected to have happen. And this is an example of an explicit kickoff. The kickoff caused effects. And so when the um, little bug went to chew, it caused something to happen, a reaction. So the beauty or the, um, the focus of um, stage three of narrative is that the causal chain is present for the first time. And that is a hallmark stage because it's cause-effect. A lot of children who have um, trauma have difficulty with the causal chain. So this is a great book to illustrate that. Another one is The Three Billy Goats Gruff. Of course, the focus is on a troll here. And it's not Poppy or Branch, the trolls of 2017. It's a troll who is an ugly troll who isn't happy and joyful and tries to prevent the uh, goats from going over the bridge to eat the grass on the other side. So we infer, as we read this version by Janet Stevens, we infer feelings and plans. Um, when the goats confer, they have a meeting and they decide what to do. So it's a great one to use as a think aloud bridge from this kickoff and reaction to, the, to a higher level. This one is another folk tale. Joseph had a little overcoat. And the kickoff is not something that happens or that someone buzzes in someone's ear or um, the troll roars. It is that there is a piece of clothing that becomes old and worn. And the little um, Joseph make something else out of it. So um, he had an overcoat, and it was old and worn. So he made a jacket out of it. The jacket became old and worn, so he made a scarf out of it, a vest out of it. So we have the word so, which is a cohesive tie that is a big focus of story grammar marker and the whole concept, the whole approach of mind wing to use cohesion to connect the parts of a story together. So that's a feature of this particular book. Alexander and the Horrible, No Good, Very Bad Day is featured on our website. It's a personal narrative modeling book. Alexander had 26 kickoffs on this horrible, terrible, very good, very bad day. Um, it mirrors some of our days sometimes.
he wants to go to Australia is the reaction each of these kickoffs but you can take each kickoff and infer feelings and maybe even think about what plans he might do but as the book is written it's written as a series of kickoffs and Alexander's reaction this book courage um, I'm going to present in another stage as well but this is a book to generate kickoffs for situations that require courage. Um, there are big and small moments in life that require the human being to be courageous. So it's a way to um, talk about how being the first one to apologize takes courage. Um, and exploring space takes courage. So there are physical and social kickoffs that require um, courage. So we're talking about a kickoff, um, a group of kickoffs in this book that require um, a, a person to have courage. Noisy Nora is kickoffs and reactions. Noisy Nora creates noise to be noticed. She's the middle mouse of a family of mice and has a younger sibling and an older sibling and feels that she does not get noticed so she makes noise she still doesn't get noticed so she stops making noise and she does get noticed when her family realizes how important she is so it's focusing on the needs of each child and how children would like to be noticed but it's the kickoff, use of the verb so of the um, excuse me cohesive tie so and another kickoff so it's a series of kickoffs I wanted to mention I love um, these elephant and piggy books by Mo Willems um, they are very um, indicative of narrative development this one shows a long kickoff and it shows that a kickoff can develop over time the kickoff is a rainstorm and it went from a drop of rain to a downpour that was a kickoff that um, the effect was or the result was that it destroyed a, um, a, a setting where these two were going to have a wonderful day playing so there's two perspectives but the main point and reason that I have it here as well as in another place later is that it shows how a kickoff can be a long time coming this next stage is the abbreviated episode it is a forerunner to a complete episode um, but it is the introduction to the feeling and it's also the introduction to what Jerome Bruner called the landscape of consciousness authors in their quest to communicate ideas um, want to either have the readers infer feelings or they will express feelings um, as a feeling word or as an action that a character might do it's important for our students to enter the landscape of consciousness where they start to notice feelings and to be able to label feelings well, the abbreviated episode is character setting kickoff feeling and then a consequence I like to use when Sophie gets angry really really angry this is a Caldecott award it is illustrating um, the, uh, the illustrations communicate very bold colors relative to anger and calm so it shows the mood which is often something mentioned in classrooms about feelings what is the mood the theme is dealing with anger and also that anger doesn't last forever double dip feelings was written by a social worker and I have loved it for years it has gone into a second edition and um, what I like about it is that it shows via the illustration of an ice cream cone a double dip there um, that feelings can occur 
that more than one feeling can occur due to a kickoff. And um, I like to focus and show the kids that with the story grammar marker itself, the feeling icon is the classiest one. It shines multiple colors, hoping that it will be a, um, a focus for children to come up with more than one feeling that a character might have. So there's a little boy on his first day of school, and they show him feeling big boy proud and little boy scared. And periodically, they ask, have you ever had two feelings at the same time? So I love this. It encourages thinking about emotions. This one is The Grouchy Ladybug, again by Eric Carl. And what I like about it is that there's a lot of feelings in it. It shows the passing of time from 6 a.m. to 6 p.m., which is kind of nice for the setting. Um, there is a plant that's covered by aphids, which shows that there's some kind of a scientific um, bent to this in that ladybugs eat aphids. And these two ladybugs were going to meet, or they were meeting on the same um, leaf. The grouchy ladybug with the bad temper did not want to share, but there was a kind ladybug sitting on the leaf too, who sets the tone for sharing and friendship. Um, the grouchy ladybug departed for a while and tried to threaten or bully other creatures who each had their own asset to stand up for his or herself. So a few things. There's the bad temper, the grouchy ladybug, the kind ladybug, and how people or characters can stand up for themselves. Today I feel silly and other moods that make my day I've used forever. It's a staple. There are great descriptive words here. Changing um, of moods depends on a kickoff. So um, we can uh, change the eyebrows, you know, on Brady. That's why um, Brady has its face that you can set up. That if a kickoff happens that causes a feeling, Brady can change its expression. So in this book, there is a little diagram at the end where you can change the eyebrows. It's a quick read. You can just use one at a time one vignette at a time. Each one has a kickoff and a feeling. This is How Are You Peeling, and it's foods with moods. It's just kind of a fun thing showing the characters as produce so that characters don't have to be human, and it takes the human aspect out of feeling frustrated, feeling surprised, and there's a range of feelings. It's a fun book on feelings. Now again, we have the book Courage. I wanted to mention here that um, Sean Sweeney uh, does a monthly blog for us on um, showing how the story grammar marker and our tools, um, expository as well, can be um, used with technology. His website is Speech Techie, but on our website you can find um, references to the books that he has used um, in our references. So one of them is Courage. And remember when I um, focused before on this book about different kickoffs that there were that required courage? Now I'm focusing on feelings. There are situations that cause people to be scared yet hopeful. And one of the situations in this is a boy on a, um, a beach who has just completed a beautiful sandcastle. And other children come and run through the beautiful sandcastle and destroy it. He shows on his face that he is angry, very, very upset. But it requires courage to build again. And I'm thinking of our friends in Texas and Florida as they begin to build again, they're showing courage. So this book is really a good one to use at this time. 
Um, My Friend is Sad, which is another elephant and piggy book, where Gerald and Piggy notice the feelings of each other. And that's all I'm really going to say about that. It's full of wonderful drawings expressing feelings. Bear Feels Scared, which is a staple of preschool garden classrooms. It's the uh, compassion and friendship theme. Um, The setting is uh, very important here because the bear is in his forest den feeling very calm and confident. But in going out of the den, he begins to search for food and gets lost, which changes his feeling to what? To fear. And even though he's big, he can still be afraid, which teaches us a lesson. Um, His friends notice that he is not there, which is a kickoff for them. And they come together and rescue him because they wonder where he is. So so the setting is very important. He's not where he should be. He must be somewhere else. Let's find him. Um, So in the, I I like to focus too on the illustrations in here. As he goes further and further into the forest, the illustrations are darker and darker and darker. In his cave though, it's very warm colors. In My Heart is a newish um, picture book that is unique because there are cutouts showing kickoffs for a variety of feelings that would foster classroom discussion about what kickoffs might cause these feelings. So I think that you'd really enjoy it. They are, um, the colors are, you know, for instance, red for anger, but there are other more muted colors. This is The Rope, a story from the Great Migration by Jacqueline Woodson, who is a wonderful author. She received Newbery Honor, Coretta Scott King Award um, for this book, and it's the journey of people who possessed a rope, a jump rope, um, from South Carolina north during the Great Migration. And there are feelings that are focused on at each of the places that the jump rope ends up. So it's pulling together the past memories with the future um, hopes. So I think that you'd really like that one. It also shows country and city life in oil paint. Themes are hope, love, and memories. Stage five is the complete episode. It's the basic unit of a plot. So here, stories are more complex in their content because look at this, the critical thinking triangle is there, the kickoff, the feeling, the plan, the consequence. There's a little heart at the end also that is the reflection of how things turned out, the lessons that were learned, and the like. One of these books that I like here is Giraffes Can't Dance about Gerald solving a problem. So problem solving is huge for the complete episode. It's not only that it's the basic unit of a plot, but it is also the basic unit of problem solving. There's advice given by a small, small cricket that helps a great big animal, similar to the little bear, the big bear that we talked about just a minute ago. The message is resilience and that Gerald will dance on his own time. He finds his own rhythm. So there's the kickoff where he is um, told that he can't dance like the other animals and there's his feelings, but he solves a problem. Fireflies, again, is a free lesson. Um, Personal narrative and memories. I like to use it as um, indicative of a personal narrative. It's the experience of going out and catching fireflies. Um, It makes the human happy, but the fireflies feel trapped. So it's the beginning of points of view. Alaska's Three Bears was sent to us by colleagues in Palmer, Alaska. And it's 
a growing um, genre where there is a narrative and there's also a narrative there is a narrative at the top of this uh, of each page with beautiful illustrations but at the bottom of each page is expository information about the topic which is the three bears the brown bear the black bear and the polar bear um, so it's a combination of text types it's teaching about various bears habitats so there is a scientific bent there the legend of the Indian paintbrush um, there's a Native American little golfer who is um, trying to bring the sunset to earth and explain how that was brought to earth and needed a paintbrush um, so when that was um, the focus he needed to paint the colors of the sunset and the Indian paintbrush solved that problem. The Three Bears itself is a traditional folk tale um, and it is Goldilocks and her perspective and the Three Bears and their perspective. It is problem solution. So there are kickoffs on the parts of both of them, two perspectives. And that one perspective can be a group of people. So in life, we have groups of people who have certain perspectives, and they have an influence on single people, people by themselves, or they could have influence on another group. Harold and the Purple Crayon has been around for over 50 years, and Harold, using his purple crayon, draws what amounts to be multiple episodes but he begins with the character with the setting and draws a road it models writing and that shows children that they can begin to write by drawing pictures and whatever they draw they can talk about because oral language is the foundation for writing so you can go from just using a purple crayon to a picture to being a cartoonist and ultimately a graphic novelist if you want. There's a series of these. Um, there's another one called Pictures. Harold illustrates pictures in a room. Peter's Chair by Ezra Jack Keats is also a um, complete episode. When Peter sees his blue furniture being painted pink, he feels frustration, but that ultimately leads to him coming to grips with his feeling as he thinks about the new addition to his family, and that leads to a plan. Frog and Toad together are referenced in Appendix B of the Common Core. They are often used as mentor texts for complete episodes. There are two perspectives, and of course, when we're talking about text complexity, it's very important that a child be able to tell two perspectives if there are two characters, because the same kickoff may lead two characters to feel differently than each other and also to create a new plan. So there are a series of five stories in this, each of them has a common setting. Uh, Ming Lo moves the mountain is a folk tale with a problem. His wife is is angry and she wants Ming, Ming Lo to um, do something about the problem. The wise man helps, and uh, instead of moving the mountain, he suggests over time that they do the dance of the moving mountain and move away from the mountain rather than moving the mountain. So. Uh, the feelings are great in it, and it is a cultural folktale, Chinese culture. Frog on His Own by Mercer Mayer. I don't have to say much probably to a lot of you about why I'd like uh, the Mercer Mayer books. They're wordless books, so children can come up with their own script. Um, they can talk about, it's a series of episodes, so it's not just one story but there are almost chapters within um, this particular book, Frog on His Own. But the Mercer Mayer books have been used for assessment of children's narratives in the strong narrative assessment and others, dynamic assessments. Um, they've also been used for instruction and intervention. 
what pet should I get by Dr. Seuss? I, of course, had to use a Dr. Seuss book because, again, the home, his family home where he grew up as a child is just one block from my office, from where I'm talking from tonight. Um, so it's a personal experience that he had at the age of 10, because there's a little um, biography in the back about him. And um, when faced to um, make a choice, often we don't know what to do. And we go through many, many attempts to get there. At the end, it's very Seussian because we really don't know what he chose. The other side is a book by Jacqueline Woodson again, and it's two girls of different cultures meeting at a fence. Each girl is interested in the girl on the other side. Clover and Annie are the characters. And the illustrations do one wonderful thing. They show the similarities between the girls and not the differences. So it's a great book to use for a think aloud. The complex episode now is stage six. And that's where we get into some novels because in addition to picture books having more than one kickoff, of course, novels do. And these, these are called embedded episodes. They are embedded in the main episode. The first one I love to use is Calvin Can't Fly. And it's the story I use for social communication um, and social skills, but it's a bookworm bird who did not learn to fly. And when it came time to fly south for the winter, he couldn't do it. He was, however, rescued by his brothers, sisters, and cousins who came to get him and carry him south. So that's the embedded episode. But within that, on the way south, they come upon a hurricane. And it describes in depth a quoted section from a science book about a hurricane. So um, it shows everything that happened recently. So it's a book with a hurricane as an embedded episode and a scientific part. Clifford and the Big Storm is also about storms, and uh, but what I was using it for is there are multiple kickoffs, each one signaling a new episode that Clifford had to tend to. And it's analyzed in great detail over 10 pages in the SGM manual, the Story Grammar Marker manual, but it's also on um, our website. Clifford Takes a Trip is another one of Clifford where he sets out to go on a family trip and he overcomes many kickoffs embedded in one another to join them. This shows the complexity of narrative text. Big Al and Shrimpy. Now, I already talked about it from the viewpoint of character comparing and contrasting, but it's also a parallel structure in that Shrimpy is smart and saves Big Al, but there is the embedded episode of Big Al getting in trouble. So it's a parallel structure, and you can easily compare it or contrast it with Big Al itself. Molly's Pilgrim is a book about immigration, Russian immigration, home life, school life, peers, feeling embarrassed and not fitting in, but the cultural view of what a pilgrim is and how pilgrims are different depending on where they're coming from. It takes all kinds of pilgrims to make a Thanksgiving, and it's all from the viewpoint of a little girl who experiences it. Bud Not Buddy is a chapter book. And as all chapter books, it illustrates embedding of episodes, but it also has important themes of homelessness, foster homes. The year is 1936, so it's a long time ago. It's situated in Michigan. His mother has passed away. His father had left. He works by his own rules. And there are all kinds of um, very wonderful scenes that you can just take as little episodes to talk to the children about. Aunt Isabel tells a good one. Model, um, it's a model for the use of our magnets. There are embedded episodes 
each one of them is a complete episode and it's a story within a story. This is a picture book, Too Many Tamales. There's a setting of the kitchen, a bedroom, and a living room. And in each of those rooms, there are kickoffs that happen that build complexity of the text. It's almost like a chapter book in a picture book form. Um, so each one is a complete episode, but they are embedded within each other, and it's um, a cultural book. Are you ready to play outside? We already looked at it in terms of the long kickoff, but in this, there are two perspectives. Um, Gerald notices Piggy and Piggy's distress and decides to solve the problem for Piggy. So it's looking at compassion. Um, one character who might notice that somebody else is very distressed and decide to do something about it. So it's a social kickoff as well. The um, stage seven, where I wanted to get to tonight, is called the interactive episode. And the judgment of complexity goes all the way through stage six. And on stage seven, it's where there's a kickoff that causes another character to have a feeling and make an explicit plan to do something about it. So within this stage, there are advanced sentence structures, complex sentences, long sentences, and there's probably advanced vocabulary as well. One of the books that <clears throat> I'd like to mention here is um, A Home Run for Bunny. That is a true story of two baseball teams situated in 1934 in the era of segregation in the South. It's a very high interest level. The lexile level is not high, but the content is high. And I noticed that when Sheila read where people were from, there was a person from Gastonia, North Carolina. And that's the place that the team from Springfield, Mass, went to participate in the playoffs to win the National Legion Baseball Championship. But one of their members, Bunny Talaferro, was an African-American champion who wasn't treated well because of the laws, and the whole team came home instead of participating. So the book has a low lexile, but a very high interest level, and it was told as a personal narrative recount by 95-year-old Tony King, who was the last remaining player on the Springfield team. There was also a reenactment and a monument made that involved Gastonia, North Carolina people, and Springfield people years ago. Uh, those shoes, where there are needs and wants that are emphasized as far as expository text, but the focus is a boy's decision process to give a treasured item to another person. It takes place in the inner city, and it really focuses on the development of the plan of a character through his experiences. So again, a personal narrative. The big wave, I used it before, but now I'm using it as far as the development of a character's feeling, thoughts, and plans to overcome diversity, um, adversity, excuse me. Um, so it's a farm and a fishing village, but really it's focusing on the characters within that farm and village. Stella Luna is a classic about a mother and baby bat. Um, the baby bat is, the mother is attacked by an owl and loses Stella Luna, who learns to live with a nest of birds, while mother looks for her. And the drawings about the mother's quest to find Stella Luna are in the front and back cover section. So mom is searching, and that's the embedded episode, but there's also information text involved. Um, are you ready to play outside? Again, is oh, excuse me, I just went to, um, 
this is corduroy, pardon me. Um, and corduroy kind of goes without saying. There are characters of the bear, the watchman, the girl, and the mom. And all of them can be told in their episodes as far as how they related to corduroy. So it's wonderful for levels of meaning as far as text complexity. Stone Fox is um, featured in the theme maker uh, um, covering about eight pages. It's realistic fiction. And again, for older kids, there are four characters through whose eyes the story can be retold. Lord of the Flies, I've often seen in my observations used by middle school and high school teachers who have used the critical thinking triangle to analyze the thoughts and feelings of the characters. So I wanted to put that here. It is definitely interactive episodic structure. The Makers Blue Marker is about um, action, um, the concept that actions cause reactions and they reactions are often feelings and thoughts of characters. This is a classroom problem that happened and it focuses on Jamaica when a little boy scribbles all over her beautiful picture that she has just finished. It involves acceptance and compassion that was almost too late. So it is something that would certainly inspire discussion. Hey Little Ant is a classic perspective taking book. The size of the illustrations is wonderful for the perspective of the character that's being done. And at the end, there's an open-ended question, what would you do? So it's a great one to use for conversation about two characters and why they did what. Running Shoes is a story uh, featured in the setting of Cambodia about a girl who, whose only uh, relative was her mother, and the only thing she did was work, but she wished to go to school. And the embedded episode is that a, um, a census worker, a case worker, comes to count the number of people in the village and comes back and gives her shoes so that she can get to school. So there are high-level themes. Uh, the lexile is not high, but the themes are poverty, death, acceptance. And when she gets to school, all the others are boys, and she is bullied. But she can run faster than the others, than the boys can. So she beats the boys at their games. Sarah, plain and tall multiple characters with embedded episodes. Um, and I, I like to use this because there are different things like comparing and contrasting the grass on the prairie with the waves in the ocean. But there are multiple characters from whose perspective to tell the story. Pierre the Penguin, a real story about a penguin who lost his feathers and the dilemma that it created for Pamela Shaler, who was an aquatic biologist and created a suit for the penguin to wear, and it saved his life. So there's an interview format. Embedding of episodes, she certainly saw a problem and made a, um, a, an effort to do something about it. Beatrice's Goat features Heifer Project International. It takes place in an African village overcoming adversity, and the gift was from people who were far away. Piggy Pie is a hilarious story with embedded episodes featuring Rich the Witch, who needs eight piggies for a pie that she's making. And she directs her broom to Old MacDonald's farm, meets a big bad wolf, and also um, actually converses with a pig disguised as Old MacDonald himself. So it's just funny, but it's full of embedded episodes and interaction among all the characters. Hatchet, 
high level, um, it's the Canadian wilderness, high level themes, one character from whose perspective to take various kickoffs. Wonder was the subject of a webinar that we gave and it's excellent for perspective taking. I recommend that you look at the lesson um, on our website. Trouble at the Watering Hole, The Adventures of Elmo and Chicky. It's a rather new book that was created by a professor at Bay Path College in Longmeadow, Mass. What struck me was that it was about how to work things out through negotiation, not necessarily argument, but how to arrive at a consensus and work through a problem. The animals at this watering hole all feel entitled to ownership of the watering hole, but it's problem solving, there's dialogue, and it's animals rather than people, which kind of gives children sometimes a more relaxed way of looking at things. There's um, a very nice parent and teacher's guide that goes along with it, so I thought I'd mention it here. I've begun to use it. Um, New York City had requested that I analyze um, the first chapter of Esperanza Rising at a workshop that I gave, but I continued to read the book. The Lexile is at a grade five, but the themes carry on through grade seven and eight. There's ways that you, you can encourage children to dig deeper. There's the Mexican War, there is death, there's the Depression era in the United States, there's the migrant worker plight, there's also wonderful interpersonal relationships between Abuel, Abuelita, the grandmother, and all of her ideas that she imparts to Esperanza, whose name means hope. Holes is just a book that I've liked to use because of its suspense. A generational curse uh, ended the character at Camp Green Lake where he's digging five by five um, shaped holes and discovers that he's not going to reach a lake but that the warden is looking for something. So it's danger and it's calmness in the face of fear, multiple kickoffs all the way through that can be just taken apart. Dr. DeSoto, one of my favorites, um, which is a classic perspective taking story that you can use as a retell. Uh, the fox, who the mouse Dr. DeSoto doesn't usually see, begs for the doctor, the dentist, to do something about his tooth. The prior knowledge that we have here is that if we've read books, we know that a fox might eat a mouse. So there are plans to figure out. The fox has a plan which was discovered during a dream when he talks during surgery, being uh, during his sleep. And then the mice make their own plan. Um, Roll of Thunder, Hear My Cry is a US history book. Um, very complex themes situated in rural Mississippi um, during segregation. The land gives the characters pride and each chapter I have found a complete episode in that I could isolate and talk about. So there is great complexity of themes um, but the plan is to survive and prosper. Charlotte's Web is something that I've used in a webinar before and there is a lesson but it takes place in upstate New York or not takes place but that's where the author studied pigs and spiders and rats to create this classic. My favorite part is that there's a meeting among the animals to decide how to outsmart the rat. That's a classic for theory of mind. And there's also the scientific classification of spiders. Knuffle Bunny, there are four characters here again, and there's a wonderful lesson on our website. Maul Willems has written about Trixie, uh, three char four characters, Trixie, Dad, Mom, and Knuffle Bunny, to talk about each of their perspectives and how they relate to each other. Four Feet, Two Sandals is the characters are at, at a Pakistanian um, refugee camp 
Lena and Faroga. They are two girls who each get one sandal when there is a um, something that comes to give clothing. Um, and they become friends. And um, it's really a wonderful human interest book. Many messages. The final one that I'm going to mention tonight is Letting Swift River Go by Massachusetts author Jane Yolen. And it's about um, the flooding of the Swift River Valley, which was in the middle of the state of Massachusetts in the 1930s when a growing Boston population needed water. People were told to get out of their villages and it disrupted four towns. Um, they couldn't adequately protest because newspapers were really the only things that were around. They tried to get their point across in a town meeting, which the book shows. But imagine now, with the influence of technology, what would happen in 2017 with the Swift River Valley? So these are my favorite among my favorite books, there are many others, but I wanted to give you a wealth of um, stuff tonight. And I hope that you enjoyed um, each one that I did. Um, but don't leave because we have um, something to say. Can you hear me? Okay. Sorry about that. We're still learning how to switch back and forth between these. Um, someday we'll, we'll have it figured out. Um, so just want to go over a few things with you. I know we're running a little over time, but um, let's see. I can move this so I can click this. If you can see my screen, which I think you can see my screen. I hope you can. Um, this is one of the handouts that you're getting tonight. Um, I'm not going to talk too much about it, but this is going to show you the relationship between narrative and expository text. And I think we're going to probably be doing a, another presentation later in the year that will focus on books Mary Ellen likes to use for expository text because I think people would really like that. Um, this is another handout that you're getting and don't forget to download your hands out, handouts on the right. This is Egbert, the slightly cracked egg, and we've used this over the years. It's one of Mary Ellen's staples. We've given this to you. This is Egbert written out at each um, of the, uh, or analyzed at each of the stages, seven stages of narrative development. So you're getting this as well. Also, you'll be getting these writer helper forms. Now these are in our story grammar marker manual um, if you want to actually start using them, but this shows how you would first use these to help children to write or retell the story at the different stages um, all the way up to the complex um, episode. Um, and let me check what's going on with the handouts. So, yeah, this is it. Do you see what I'm talking about? This is what it should look like. If you see that one, if I click on it. If you have a problem downloading the handouts, okay, go to this link. So one of the, I'm going to start Mary Ellen with a couple questions that people ask during the webinar. And um, if anyone else has any other questions, ask away. And um, okay, uh, okay. I'm gonna I'm gonna send it back over to Mary Ellen after I read this. Hold on one second. Um, oh, so I'm gonna read this question to her. Um, okay. Um, one thing uh, is that. When you have multiple kickoffs, what is the best way to address that? It seems to sound complicated. Well, I'm going to I'm going to switch you over. So I'm going to switch Mary Ellen back. Okay. Okay. So when you have multiple kickoffs, it is complex because that builds the complexity of a narrative. So when people are looking at text complexity, 
That's why I want our tools, our tools to use to assist kids developing the concept of what makes a story complex. And um, so that's one thing. Now, Big Al is a picture book. It has two embedded episodes. So what I do is I take each kickoff and I talk about them in terms of the story grammar marker using the magnets and I carry it out. But as that you way. start to use our tools and you start to think in this way, it makes the complexity very much more manageable. So I did want to mention something um, about the complexity. When you get to a stage seven, so say there's a book that I have put at a stage seven, it's also a six and a five and a four and a three and a two and a one. So I often say to people in workshops that you can take whatever book or video or something that you're looking at that isn't a book um, and you can focus on the characters and the settings in that book. You can focus on the actions in that book. You can take several kickoffs out of that book and talk about them. So what we're talking about tonight is the narrative and how you can reduce complexity or build complexity. That's why I showed you those books. Some of them I showed twice. That meant that they were actually at a higher level, but they were wonderfully useful for something at a lower level. So, so the um, the elements for beginning, middle, and end. The beginning of a story or of an episode is up to the plan. The middle are the attempts that a character makes to carry out the plan. And the end is how things turned out when the character did what he did. And then the reflection on how everything was. But if, um, say there was a kickoff in the middle of a story, like there is with Big Al, where he gets, um, where he sees his would-be friends being caught in a net because Big Al is. Okay, so there is an embedded episode here. I would put that right on, showing them. I don't know if you can see me or not, because my um, computer is flashing here at this point for some reason. But anyway, I would talk about the complexity in the middle of a story because there's a kickoff that's occurring there. And over time, children get to be aware that the basic unit is the basic unit, but new kickoffs could occur anywhere along that basic unit. I would do that. I would. Um, I. I could. Um, I could look at narrative. I could look at the initiating events that happen in our theme maker manual. I spent a lot of time going over Stone Fox, uh, which was one of the books I talked about tonight. And I talked about how, as you're going, th as you, the teacher, would be going through a novel with older kids, you would read it ahead of time, of course. And in that particular chapter that you were reading, you may find a scenario where there's a particular character facing some kind of a dilemma, forcing a feeling and a plan um, come, to come from that character. That would be what you'd take out of that chapter. 
So if I came upon, for instance, in um, uh, the um, experiences that he had that would be information text, um, there's an owl in the shower. There's an, that's a, a novel. In other words, my answer is yes there. I would use information text maps whenever I could to show them that an author not only has to know how to tell a story, but what makes the story interesting is the details that the author pulls in because the author knows information text. I mentioned there's an owl in the, in the shower. Um, that's a novel about um, the snowy owl habitat in the Pacific Northwest. And if the author didn't know a lot about that problem and about how owls were in their habitat, the book wouldn't have had the detail that it had. So it's kind of that. I think that there's just um, there's something wrong with his brain, so I think he just found it. Um, Okay. All right. Well, I hope you enjoyed this tonight. I put, with my staff, put a lot of effort into it, hoping that you would come away with some inspiration to really delve into narrative text and to show children that there was enjoyment to motivate children and to satisfy yourself that you were really addressing discourse language okay. skills. Okay, thank you all for joining us. And I'm sorry for all the technology issues. Every time we do one, we we think we have everything solved, and I guess it's just um, the nature of the beast. So um, thank you so much for bearing with us.